many people in 11 states of the old Confederacy, from Virginia to Texas, could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. I know, because 50 years ago, I was only 23 years old, had all of my hair and a few pounds lighter. <laughs> Growing up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I started Troy, a little town called Troy. Attending school in Nashville, Tennessee, and moving to Atlanta. I saw segregation and racial discrimination. Tasted the bitter fruits of racism. And I didn't like it. So a few years earlier, I heard of Rosa Parks. I heard the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. on old radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the leadership and vision of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me. As a young child, I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, and my great grandparents, why segregation? Why racial discrimination? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But the people in Montgomery, the leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and many others, inspired me to get in trouble. I got in trouble, but I call good trouble necessary trouble. Just think, especially those of you that are so young, 50 years ago, there was so much action, so much drama in the American South. Bull Connor, the police commissioner of Birmingham, Alabama, had used dogs and fire hoses on young children, on women, on people involved in peaceful, nonviolent protests. Dr. King had been arrested with other ministers. Young people in Nashville, in Mississippi, and other places have been arrested in jail. <coughs> Mega Evers was assassinated. President John F. Kennedy spoke to the nation about the growing frustration the great sense of discontent in the American South. He said, in effect, that we must act, that the Congress must act. He was the first president who said that the question of civil rights is a moral issue. And I remember so well when the President of the United States invited six of us to meet with him at the White House. A. Philip Randolph, labor leader, a champion for civil rights and human rights, the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. This man had threatened a march in 1941 during the Roosevelt administration. Along with Martin Luther King Jr., James Palmer of CORE, Whitney Young of the National Urban League, Roy Wilkins of the NACP. In that meeting, Mr. Randolph spoke up in his very strong voice. And he said, Mr. President, the monsters are restless and we're going to march on Washington. President Kennedy didn't like the idea of hundreds and thousands of people coming to Washington. He said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder if we would never get a civil rights bill through the Congress? A few days later, the six of us, I was there representing the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC. A few days later, we met at the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City. We invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in the issue of the call for the March on Washington. 
We organized, we mobilized, and on August 28, 1963, more than 250,000 Americans, black and white. That's what the media said, but I think it was one of the greatest undercounts of all time. I think it was many more. Early that morning, we left our hotel, we went up to Capitol Hill, we met with members of the House, members of the Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, the leadership. We started down Constitutional Avenue, and we looked toward Union Station. We saw a sea of humanity, just hundreds and thousands of people. The people were already marching. It was like saying, there go my people, let me catch up with them. And they literally pushed us toward the Washington Monument on toward the length of Memorial. So many of, of us were there. And Dr. King spoke and said, I have a dream today, a dream in keeping with the American dream. Karen Finney of MSNBC, this wonderful, gifted journalist, leader in her own right, a champion, is going to moderate this panel. And really we're going to find out, well, where do we go from here? 50 years after the March on Washington, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, after the election of President Barack Obama. Where do we go from here? The first time I came to Washington, D.C. in 1961, when I was 21 years old, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a Greyhound bus or a Trailway bus. And now we're here. In 1961 in Montgomery, Alabama, we couldn't be seated together in a taxi cab. So, after all these changes, they've been changes, we've made progress. And for those of you who said nothing has changed, only thing I said, come and walk in my shoes. Yes. Those signs are gone. <laughs> they will not return. The only places we will see those signs will be in a book, in a museum, on a video. But we still have a lot of problems. And there are forces in our country that want to take us back to another time, another period. But I hope that in this discussion that we would have some ideas that were sent to the world that we're not going back. We're going forward. We're going to continue to make progress and make our country, make this little piece of real estate what it should be. But no one will be left out or left behind. Karen, thank you so much for being here. I know you're going to introduce members of the town. You're going to moderate. Thank you. More than lucky, but very blessed to have you. Thank you. feeling like we're taking steps forward, but there are forces trying to take some things back. That vote today is going to be very important. It's a real important signal. I'm actually going to ask members of the panel to introduce themselves, starting with going from my uh, my left to the, to the far right the stage. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Gail Christopher, Vice President for Program Strategy at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And in that role, I'm honored to lead our work on addressing stru structural racism and racial healing. Uh, my name is Malik Yoba, and I used to be a white man. <laughs> <laughs> but there has been change. <laughs> Philip Agnew, 
who I serve as the executive director of the Dream Defenders. I'm a native of Chicago. I'm 28 years old. We work in Florida. I'm very excited to be here. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Brown Dianis, and I'm co director of Advancement Project. We are a next generation civil rights organization that has um, works across the country on issues around education and voting rights. And I actually have the pleasure of working with the two people on both sides of me and supporting the building of the racial justice movement. Thank you. My name is Dr. William Barber. I'm president of North Carolina NAACP and chair of the Political Action uh, Committee of the National NAACP Board uh, and one of the coordinators and leaders of the Moral Monday campaign uh, in North Carolina. I was born, uh, Representative Lewis, two days after you spoke at the March on Washington, mm -hmm. August 30th, 1963. And I am a preacher that believes that uh, all things are possible, so it could be possible that you could have been white. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to keep coming back to that. That's right. <laughs> right. There's my dad. There's my dad. <laughs> I want to start um, based on something that the congressman was talking about because as we've you know been reflecting over these last months, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and sort of all the things that came after that and frankly the movement before, yes, it's true, we don't have to go to separate bathrooms and we can sit next to each other and we can eat next to each other. But it feels like there are structural inequalities, some with very long historical roots that we have yet to be able to unearth, some that are new, like the voting restrictions that we're seeing, that based on the reality that our community is growing and we are engaging in political action. And so to try to quell our voices, I think there's more activity around making it harder for us to vote. And so it feels like there are things like standard ground laws. Um, and certainly, Reverend Barber, my goodness, in North Carolina, I feel like you are the model of all of the worst of those conservative uh, policies. They're all trying to put it all in one place in terms of uh, middle, hurting middle class Americans, in terms of voting rights, um, in terms of working people, women. And it, so it strikes me that while we don't have the sort of formal signs anymore, we do still have barriers. And I can tell you from my perspective, on television, when we talk about these things, you know, if the right wing team tends to treat us like we're kind of like we're crazy, like we're making it up. And that also feels very uh, reminiscent to me of, you know, sort of Congressman Lewis talking about a time when people said, don't make trouble, right? Don't stone. Um, and so, your voices are so important and the work that you're doing is so important because we do need to keep pushing back. We do, these problems do exist. And so I'm gonna actually start um, with you, Phil. I want you to talk about what you are doing. I'm gonna ask each of you to really talk about from your perspective. We wanna try to touch on a lot of different issues and a lot of different areas where we're trying to make progress. Um, but, so I'm gonna start with you as the, I, the youngest member. I'll take that. Um, uh, good afternoon everyone again. Um, as I said, I work with an organization called the Dream Defenders and uh, some of you may not have heard of us and that's acceptable and we hope to change that as we grow. Uh, we started in the wake of Trayvon Martin's murder and so um, in a time when the entire country was waiting uh, for a man to be arrested for murdering a child, not just a black child but a child, um, a group of us uh, marched for 40 miles from Daytona Beach to Sanford, Florida in the name of justice for Trayvon Martin. And it was after that march uh, that a group of uh, students from around the state of Florida and one from New York um, be decided to start the Dream Defenders using the civil rights movement as our compass and our blueprint. Um, a major builder of that blueprint uh, being the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And so we now have chapters at eight schools around the state of Florida, engaging them in what it means to build true power uh, in the state for young people and people that look like us. Um, we're also seeking to uh, democratize the knowledge that 
um, kind of has been hoarded around what it means to organize in your community and give it to the people that need it the most, which are black people, which are poor people, which are brown people, um, and which the Occupy movement touched on but didn't really hash out, um, really gen gen genuinely the 99%, right? All of us who don't have, um, who weren't allowed and still aren't allowed. And so what we've been doing since we got started a year ago is working um, against the criminalization of our generation. Um, Michelle Alexander's book is our Bible. And so we see around the country, including in the state of Florida, um, and really most notably in the state of Florida, a burgeoning corrections industry um, that hinges on race, that hinges on class. And we, um, using once again the SNCC model, are building a resistance to that um, that culminated uh, in a 30-day or 31-day occupation of the state capitol. 31 days and 30 nights we lived in the capitol. We built a city inside of the capitol. We were inside the capitol of Florida longer than the governor was. We know his reception is better than he does. Um, and so we did, we uh, spent time drafting something we're calling Trayvon's Law, working with the NAACP um, uh, to draft legislation that pushes our lawmakers to in Stand Your Ground to address the school to prison pipeline and to eliminate and or address racial profiling in our police systems and our neighborhood watchmen. Um, and though it's hard to legislate against racial oppression, we're gonna give it a try. Um, and so we've been building a, a youth movement, a youth and student movement around those issues for the better part of the year. And uh, we intend and we believe that we will win because it's been done before and we've got some tools at our disposal that amplify our voices. Twitter, I put my Twitter hash, my Twitter hash, I'm at Phil Unchained. Um, and so it's important to us that young people know that uh, we're ready. Young people are ready to take whatever torch there is, we're ready to grab hold of it, and we won't let it fall until we want. done is, is has really sent a signal across the country that and also with moral mondays and some of the things we saw in texas that movement is still possible that, mm -hmm. that there is a, a way to make your voice heard and i think for a long time people were feeling like these things have been happening particularly at the state level without any kind of pushback mm -hmm. um, but we know that so many of these laws that we're talking about the, the stand your ground law right in particular are happening at the state level which mm -hmm. means State elections. So, right. what are you doing in terms? Of, are you registering voters yes. and are you motivating and making sure? Because I think it's so important that as black and brown people, I mean, we came out and we elected a president, we re-elected a president, but if we don't vote in the state elections mm -hmm. and midterm elections, we can lose ground. Okay. Yes, you're very correct. And so, um, uh, Dr. King said, "Voting is the foundation stone for all political action." So it's a beginning, it's a start for us. So to answer your question directly, we've committed to registering 61,550 voters in the state of Florida. That's the margin of victory our governor Rick Scott won by in 2010. So we do have a commitment to registering voters. And um, a block of voters that vote on issues, that vote with a purpose and don't vote for a politician or don't vote for pandering. Uh, because we've heard it from blue ties and red ties. And um, it's time for us as young people to add value to our vote. Our vote is a coin, and right now we're throwing it in wishing wells and slot machines. And so um, we're seeking to add value back into our votes. And um, so, yes, so we, we're going to be voting. We're ready to vote. <laughs> we'll hold you to that. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Christopher, I want to um, ask you about the Florida Democratic Party. Mm -hmm and uh, equality and equal access and opportunity. I mean, Philip is obviously an incredible example and I think he's helping to create this next generation of young people who um, have a sense of their rights have, and have a sense of their power. But what do you see in the work that you're doing with young people? Because it, you know we're still hit with so many images and messages that really challenge that sense of self. Thank you for the question, and it's certainly an honor to be here, and certainly in the presence of one of the icons of our, of our movement. At the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, um, we basically decided that we had to do something to assure that all children had a chance to thrive. 
And when we recognize that the majority of the children in this country by 2018 will be children of color, we knew that we had to address the fundamental barrier they still face, which we believe is the false belief, the ideology of human hierarchy based on physical characteristics. Now that's racism. It's the belief that somehow we are different as human beings based on how we look. And we did have a civil war in this country, and we did have a civil rights movement, and we continue to make changes, but we have never addressed that fundamental lie. That's the work of the 21st century. So people often say to us, well, what will that look like? I think, long after I've left the planet, children will open their books, and they will read about how, at one time, we believed in the myth of human hierarchy based on physical characteristics. And when we believed that, we built a whole structure based on that fallacy. So we can't tinker around the edges of this in this century. We are dealing with the effects, the tragedy of the Trayvon Martin murder. And the lack of justice there was an outpicturing of that belief that somehow his life didn't matter. And so our board of directors at the foundation had the courage to put up $100 million to fuel and fund work that will ultimately address the residue of racism that still undergirds every system in our country. That $100 million was a drop in the ocean of what it will take to really do this work. But I am so honored to be on the panel with all of these young people. I think I'm probably the oldest person up here. And I can say that with pride, because I'm still here. <laughs> you know, you get to a point where you're a bunch of you know, and then you kind of go, well, that's all right. You know? uh, so I'm at that point. We have funded uh, hundreds, at least 500 groups around the country, many are here at the table, uh, to continue to do this important work. Reverend Barbara, I want to build on something that Dr. is talking about, because I think part of this idea of hierarchy, part of the way that that is institutionalized, I think in the national conversation, as I said, we're having about SNAP, about who's worthy and who's not. I mean, a lot of the policy ideas that we see coming forward are essentially reestablishing the hierarchy in some instances and um, cementing them in others, and as I said, I think in North Carolina, you've gotten a barrage of legislation at the state level that is really designed to do just that. Will you talk about what you've been doing in North Carolina? Well, Karen, thank you so much, and to uh, Representative Lewis, who's been such a hero to so many of us. Part, part of what we have to do, I think, Karen, when we look at these issues that we face, is you're exactly right. If you're gonna change America, you gotta think states. And if you're going to think states, you've got to think southern states. Because while we may have had signs to come down, uh, some of the substance of race, race, racial inequality, particularly in policy and policy makers, is still working. And we have to understand, I, I'm, I'm always intrigued by this young versus old conversation being a preacher, because for me, Joshua and Moses have to be together. Amen. Um, and and Amen. What, what's more important to me is a, it's, it's kind of like a scripture in Hebrew. It's one of Dr. King's favorite scriptures. We are not of those who shrink back into destruction, but we are those who persevere into the salvation of souls. In other words, we got to know who we are. And in order to know who we are, we have to know where we are in America. Amen. Now let me try to do this quick. What we are seeing today is not new. It is the American way. And the American way is always to go forward and then hiccup. That progress and then regress. One of the things I think we have to do to understand this movement is stop for a moment and understand history. You get 1868 after slavery, you get four years of major progress. You get the greatest change in voting rights, criminal justice rights, labor rights, tax policy rights, educational rights. But what do you get in four years? A movement starts called the Redeemer Movement, which is the precursor to the Tea Party today. That movement says we have to redeem America 
from the influence of blacks and whites working together to move the country further. We've got to stop Reconstruction. And by 1898, with all kinds of things, including violence, attacks by the Supreme Court as early as the 1880s, and then ending with Plessy versus Ferguson, we stopped fusion politics. It was dead in the water. Basically, the African American vote went to zero in most places in the South. Then we get a second Reconstruction, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall walks into a Supreme Court where he can only count two votes, nine Supreme Court justices, one of them a Klan member, and wins. And that starts the Civil Rights Movement. 55, Emmett Till is killed. That's why Rosa Parks sits down, because on August 28th, she was moved by what happened to Emmett Till. So on December 1st, 1955, she sits down. And between 54 and 64, you get all of the major changes. Major changes in Social Security, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. But what do you get in 65? A hiccup. You get Goldwater. You get Kevin Phillips saying to Richard Nixon, we got to figure out a way to call white people in the South to vote against their own best interest. Let's call it the white Southern strategy. Yeah. Let's learn a way to talk about race in the abstract. Mm -hmm. And by 1968, with the killing of King, Martin, Malcolm, mm -hmm. and all so many others, Viola LaRusso, white woman, the second reconstruction is in. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens then? In 2007, for instance, in North Carolina, by the way, they're not attacking us in North Carolina or anywhere in the South because of our weakness, but because of the strength. Oh, come on. So in 2007, we formed this coalition of 160 organizations, the NAACP leading with 100 branches, and we call it Fusion Politics in the 21st Century. And we won just one thing, the most progressive voting laws ever. Before President Obama was even a candidate, President Obama runs, he wins North, well, he actually loses North Carolina. They told y'all he won North Carolina. <laughs> but the truth, and G.K. Butterfield will tell you, he lost 65 counties. He won 35, but he won because we, by that time, we had won same-day registration, early voting, Sunday voting, and created a model whereby young people could come in in droves, and they registered early, and that pushed him over the top. Now, what did that do? That scared the bejesus. <laughs> Because that was the first time since 76 that a Democratic candidate had won in North Carolina. And the, those in the South had never imagined a black man would win with a progressive leader. So it wasn't the president victory. It was the coalition of black, black, white, brown, gay, straight, labor, faith, young people coming together. And so after that victory, we saw the beginning of the Third Reconstruction. That's where we are in history. And, the, and you must know that whenever this nation is in a reconstruction period, it will only last a few years before there is a deconstruction period. Yeah. So now in North Carolina, where you see them passing the most race-based redistricting plans since the 19th century, attacking voting laws, we are seeing deconstruction at work. What we have found now is this time we can't wait for it to be completed. Come on now. And so in January, we didn't come together black. We came together, black, white, Latino, gay, straight, labor, people of faith, with one understanding that the only way you can fight in states in the South is to have an anti-racist, anti-poverty, deeply moral, deeply constitutional coalition that changes the language, changes the landscape, allows you to organize whether the white Southern strategy doesn't expect you to organize. And since then, we've had a thousand people engaged in civil disobedience. We've had five, a million people hit our uh, social media. The governor and I left yesterday since this movement has been going on is 31% in the poll. Moral Mondays is 48% in the poll. <laughs> and, 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 because last week, this is good news for Rep. Representative Lewis, he needs something with so many, he's done so much warrior. Two, three weeks ago, we went Mitchell County, 99% white, 89% black. They invited the NAACP president to come there. Working class mountain white folk saying they are now joining the Mall Monday movement because what the other conservatives are doing is hurting them. Now, we didn't go out there and talk Republican Democrat because that language is exclusive. We didn't talk liberal conservative. We went up there and talked something as old as my grandma. What's right Come on, and now. what's wrong. And so in this new century, we have to lift some old language Come on. and give it new life. Yes, sir. The old language that Dr. King said about some things are just moral and some things are immoral. Right. And we have to dust off the Constitution 
and lift up these principles like establishing justice, the common good, and no longer can we finally allow the ultra-right Christians to hijack Come the on. moral high ground yeah. and let us think that the only moral issue are abortion, homosexual, homosexuality, and who you sleep with. Budgets are moral issues. Healthcare is a moral issue. that can bring people together that not only don't look like us, but they will transform the South and transform the nation. And in a sense, Karen, finally, while we are in a painful situation in North Carolina, we are also in a hopeful situation. Mm -hmm. Because there is a scripture, Psalm 119, 71, says it was good for me that I was afflicted. Yes. <laughs> yes. They have hurt so many people in North Carolina mm -hmm. that it's bringing us all together. <laughs> And 2020, with the demographic, are going to be a new day if we stay the course and believe that all things are possible. Mm -hmm. I just have a follow-up on that. Because I think one of the things that's so important about what is going on is that the movement, the Moral Monday movement, is grounded in values and morals and coalition building. Right. And that's not always something we've done as well as we could or should. So my question to you is, because you've done it so well in North Carolina, how do we bring that to other states? How, how, do, we, how do we get that to Florida for my friend here? Well, 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 so the kind of coalition, yeah, though, that yeah. you're talking about that can really bring people together around well, you, a you, cluster of issues. You can't wait on the grant to come. We started seven years ago. We started challenging Democrats. So you have to have integrity. You can't just get mad when Republicans are in office. We challenged Democrats seven years ago. We had to fight Democrats for same-day registration. Number two, you've got to have the right language that brings people together. You've got to believe in new alignments where you bring people together around issues and agenda. Uh, uh, and and, and, and you've got to destroy the myth of the white southern strategy that it is possible to hurt some people and not hurt other people. And, and then you've got to build people who can organize. See, we got a guy on our, our team that whose granddaddy was a clan member. He organized it where I can't organize. <laughs> but he so goes to the and says, do you realize that when an ultra-conservative governor cuts 500,000 people Medicaid because he doesn't like the president, that does, doesn't hurt black people, that hurts white people, that hurts Republicans. The other thing is, it doesn't happen overnight. I want y'all to understand, Marl Monday, contrary to media, didn't just pop up out of the sky. Right. If 17 of us had gone in that capital and we hadn't built relationships over seven years and struggled over seven years, it would have been 17 of us in there, 17 of us out of there, and that would have been the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality is when we went together, black, and white, and Latino, and even one lady with cerebral palsy, we went in there after having done seven hard years of spade work even when we had no resource. The story is, Karen, we had 20,000 people in the state capitol in February. The story is that 70% of African Americans voted in the last election. North Carolina's had the highest turnout for the last two cycles, but it was the redistricting mm -hmm. that actually did not get stopped at the uh, uh, of Justice Department that allowed, you see, more people to vote for progressives, but, but more conservatives won. That's enough. Then finally, Karen, I think that when we talk about building these coalitions, and I want to say this with deep love and respect, mm -hmm. it does not happen by a, a so-called national leader helicoptering in <laughs> to a state and then leaving. State movement, movements don't start from Washington, D.C. down. They start from Montgomery. <laughs> cities with people in jail in August 28. You had a movement, it, it, you brought the balls up. That's right. And so we, we got to get our elders, many of our elders who are national leaders and all, to understand your job is not to come to Florida and be the also, or come to North Carolina. The job what Dr. King said on was that he said go back. He was talking to the people from Mississippi, go back to Mississippi, go back to North Carolina. So we need elders who are elders now who have paid great dues to 
to, to support the work. So, Ken, if you have a TV show, we don't need you to come to North Carolina and lead the movement. We just need a little access to your show. Come so on. <laughs> Indigenous leadership, indigenous leadership, indigenous leadership, indigenous leadership, indigenous leadership, not MVPs, but indigenous leadership on the ground who live there, who will stay there, and who can fight every day. And when we do that, when we do that, that's why Jesus didn't, didn't operate from heaven and come down. He came down and went back up. Wow. Yeah, sure, yeah. There's one I've asked for a couple times, but she's real hard to get. Oh, no, you can try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm all friends, my friend. Uh, <laughs> so, Judith, I'm with that, I'm going to come to you. Oh, man. Oh, because particularly, I mean, when we talk about... <laughs> not just in terms of, um, you know, the taking away same-day registration and, and, you know, making it harder to register to vote, early vote, redistricting. I feel like we got so focused on this voter ID discussion that we got away from a moral conversation about voting as part of our rights, our constitutional rights, in the same way that, you know, the NRA is so rabid about their Second Amendment rights. These are our rights. And I know you've done a tremendous amount of work and stopped a lot of really bad stuff from happening in, in 2012. But it goes on. There's more. We're seeing more redistricting. We're seeing more of the voter ID laws. How do we fight that? How do we keep fighting that? Um, well, thank you, Karen. And I will make your show. I want to be on your show. <laughs> uh, so first, I want to say thank you to Congressman mm -hmm. And I... on behalf of black folks. That's right. Because quite frankly, I feel like we have been lulled into complacency <laughs> such that we have dropped the ball on continuing your fight. Mm -hmm. When you marched across that bridge Come on now. with others, we didn't continue the fight. We got a Voting Rights Act and we said hallelujah Thank you, and kept stepping. And so I want to say sorry to you, to Fanny Buhayman, to Good, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerman. I want to say sorry, but we're going to be in this fight. Come on now. Um, I think that we need to understand that this fight is not a new fight. <coughs> Voting has always been at the heart of the question of who gets to be American? Who gets to participate? Who gets to have power? You know, there was a time when Irish people couldn't vote. There was a time when Italians couldn't vote. There was a time when Jewish people couldn't vote. There was a time when Native Americans couldn't vote because they said that they were not citizens. <laughs> Did you hear me? Native Americans, the first people on this land. And it was because there were those who, in, who were in power who didn't want other people to step up and have a say in their own lives. And so we know that voting has always been a struggle in our country. Black folks couldn't vote, then we could vote, then we could vote, then we could vote. We have had this back and forth about power. And now that we're in this moment where the changing demographics of America show that we have a browning of this country and that we have this progressive alliance, people are getting scared of what that means. What that means for those who have money and political power right now. And so I think that we are now at this time where we have got to keep the fight of the voting rights. You know, we had a voting rights movement. We actually, for a number of years, have had no voting rights movement. So we've got to get back to what works. This is what works. This is what works. 
Folks think that's old time organizing. It's what works. You know, I in um, I went to Florida and stayed with Phil. I only was on the floor one night. I'll admit it. <laughs> the state capitol on the marble floor, but they hooked me up with a nice bag. <laughs> and Harry Belafonte was there when we were there. And Harry said to us, I don't know if you remember this, Phil. He said that you have got to make people uncomfortable. That's right. That's right. You have got to make Florida ungovernable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I say that we, you know, while we're fighting in the courts because we advanced the project has cases just finished trial in Pennsylvania over voter ID. We're going to trial in Wisconsin in November. We, saw, we filed the papers in North Carolina on behalf of North Carolina NAACP while the, while the ink had not dried from the governor signing that bill. And we're gonna fight in the courts. And we know that the Supreme Court's not on our side. So you know what was great about the movement was that the movement wasn't waiting on the courts. That's right. The movement was leading the courts in the right direction. And so what we've got to get back to is doing the voting rights work in the streets. We've got to get back to participation. That's the other thing, is that you walked across that bridge. And for us to see the lack of participation in voting in the black community is a day of shame. We have to fight this stuff that is making it harder to vote, understand why they're trying to make it harder to vote, but at the same time, we have got to get back to the basics of building this movement and getting people engaged and ready to vote and participate and understanding that participation is not just about voting because in places like Florida where we have 900,000 people who cannot vote because of felony convictions, who are disenfranchised for a lifetime. In Virginia, 350,000, one in five African Americans, one in four African American males can't vote because of felony convictions. That is loss of power in our community. And so those people have a voice too. It may not come through the ballot, but it can come in the streets. Mm. I, I wouldn't. Because you're so right, obviously, it's about participation. It's not just about the act of voting, but then staying engaged afterwards. And if you look at, you know, I guess the question that I always have for the black and brown community, do, are we leveraging the power of the vote that we, in representation, came out in 2008 and 2012? I don't think we are. No, we're not. We're not. And when you look at local elections, so local elections are the pipeline, mm -hmm. right? To what, to what goes up to the states and then to Congress. And you, know, you can, I went to high school in New York City, 3,000 people in my high school. I could actually win a local election with that. I actually, I was senior class president. I could, with the number of votes I had, I could probably win like mayor of some city. <laughs> you know, not New York City, but other cities. Because participation rates are so low. And so we need more people to be engaging at that level. In 2014, when people think they don't care because you know, it's not the presidential, right? But we have to understand in 2010, when it wasn't a presidential, is where the power grab happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where they were able to build in power for not just 10 years through redistricting, but it actually works out to be in about 20, 20. years. Right. Yep. And so in these so-called off years, we need to stop calling them off years. Because mm -hmm. that's the on year where the dirt gets done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Karen, yes, sir. Just and one critical point of that is how we focus. One of the things I'm troubled by is when we keep saying such and such a thing is a national issue. If we go back to the 60s, Montgomery was a national issue, though it was located in a state. Mm -hmm. So right. if we're going to have people turn on, we're going to have to talk about state issues that are national issues, that have national implications. Mm -hmm. Because people are turned on by what happens to them closest to them. So everything we're fighting, Karen, the voting laws, where are they being attacked? In state county, not right. in the U.S. Okay. Congress. Right. Yeah. Trade the law, tra stand your ground. Yeah. State capital. Mm -hmm. State capital. So it's, that's why it's so important that we began to really focus on this whole, uh, a, guy, a guy from Alabama said it like this, if you want to change the nation, we got to keep saying, think states, think mm -hmm. states, think, right. states, think mm -hmm. states, think states, think states, over and over and over again until we build uh, those powerful coalitions state by state by state. And what you need to know is in the South, 
we need to do a study of the demographics so we don't fight from a place of depression. Mm -hmm. We need to fight from an offense and a place of understanding. In North Carolina, for instance, African Americans now make up 25% of the electorate. Latinos, 3%. That's 28%. Which means you only need 22% of white folk to vote their future, not their fears. Right. You see, in Georgia, it's the same thing. In Mississippi, it's 33%. Black people represent 33% of the electorate. Latinos, 4%. That's 37%. That means you only need 14%. You see, so what we have to understand is again and again and again that the people fighting us are not fighting the progressive fusion movement because of our weakness. They have read the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. They know the numbers better than we do. And so we must begin <laughs> to drill down and know those numbers. And, and this is going to sound strange. If we, never, if we didn't register another person to vote, but turned out 3% more of the vote mm -hmm. in southern states, the elections would be different. Yes, they would. Right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, Malik. I'm not going to ask you about being a white man. <laughs> I do want to, though, talk about, because I think there's another you know, piece that goes, you know, hand in hand with this, and that is, you know, when we talk about inequality and we talk about, you know, our sense of self, I mean, the media plays a huge role in that. Film plays a huge role in that. Um, and as an actor, um, you know, playing a NYPD detective, right, I mean, there, some kids see that and see that as an authority figure in a way they may not see black people in an authority figure way. I mean, hopefully now they look at a young black man and think he could be the president. But my, so my question to you is, talk, can you talk to us a little bit about in terms of the roles that, are, that you have found available to you to um, strengthen that perspective of African Americans? Because I do, it did feel like for a long time, you know, there was a handful of roles, right? The drug dealer and, you know, what have you, the convict, um, and not as many roles for African Americans, particularly African American men, um, to be seen in a positive light. Well, as a white actor in Hollywood, I feel that, okay, it's an old joke at this point. Uh, just to put things in context, I think some people may be saying, what's Malik Yoba doing up there? Obviously, I, I added a little levity at the top because these can become heavy issues. And as I look at the demographic in the room, there's a lot of folks here who have lived this, like our um, host, uh, John Lewis. And, and so I just want to say, in 1989, when I was 21, I went on the 25th anniversary of the Freedom Rides mm -hmm. on a bus, Greyhound bus from New York to Mississippi. Um, my background is actually in education, working in schools, uh, 13 high schools in New York City, working in communities, working in prisons, building schools like in Ethiopia in a little place called Aletu, working in places like uh, Spanish Town in Jamaica, working in shelters, working with communities all over the world around these issues around equality and race and, and purpose and, and how we can connect the, the dots so that the disenfranchised feel empowered. And so um, as my life took its turn toward uh, the manifestation of my childhood dream to be an artist, I found myself in uh, interesting situations. So uh, for instance, um, uh, if we start with like my first feature film, Cool Runnings, uh, that was 20 years ago, that was the first time that Disney ever did a film with four black actors. And I remember being on set um, as 25 years old, and uh, we might have been in a hotel, and the actor Leon, who had been in the game a little bit longer than me, kind of pulled my coattails and said, hey Malik, you know, quiet down. Uh, this is the first time Disney's done a movie with black folks like this, so we have to behave a certain way. And that was like the first time that I thought, wow, I didn't really think about that. Um, but obviously that film went on to be hugely successful and inspire a lot of people. Um, and then even how I got New York on the cover to play the cop, uh, that role I got as a direct result of doing an episode of Law and & Order. And to your point about the lack of roles of positive representation, I went in on this audition to play a thug because what happened to me from the very first film that I did, Cool Runnings, is I played the tough guy, the mean guy. 
So when casting directors would see me, they'd think, oh, he could be the mean guy over here or the tough guy over here. So I walk into this audition to play the thug and it turned out that one of the young ladies who was a casting assistant used to be one of the young people in my youth program. And she said, I know you're in for this role, but why don't you read for this role? And the role that I read for, if you ever saw that old episode of Law and Order, um, where it was a skinny little thing, it was based on Michael Jordan, actually. And I played a baseball player that was, it was loosely based on the gambling thing and his father died. And that role led me to the role on New York Undercover. Mm. And it was, uh, literally I was filming Law and Order, broke for lunch, went to a producer's office, auditioned for New York Undercover, got New York Undercover. So that role uh, has had profound impact on a planetary level. So when I was like 20, and I was still working at the City Kids Foundation, and I was working on my resume one day. My career goals and objectives were to create, to affect positive change in my community through my expertise in film, theater, music, and television. And at the time, I was just doing music and theater. And so, fast forward to 1994, New York Undercover comes out, and the history of television is the first time you had a black and Latino as the leads in a dramatic series to be renewed past one season. And if you do the math, except for the show Psych, which is on USA with Dulé Hill, and the white guy is actually Latino, but they never really push him as Latino. Other than that show, there's never been another show where the two leads have been people of color. That, or, or, or black and Latino. Um, so that role was actually based on real cops out of Chicago. Um, and so, as a result of, of, of doing New York Undercover, there are actually many, many, many young men and some women that became police officers because of the way we represented that show, on that show. And in fact, I just finished a film this summer for the BBC. It's called Turks and Caicos, and it filmed in Turks and Caicos. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, Christopher Walken, Winona Ryder, Helen the Bottom Carter, Ralph Fiennes. And so directed by a guy named David Hare, um, English, a director, a filmmaker. And so I'm playing an investigator in Turks and Caicos, a local guy. And so I decided I want to do a little research with a local cop. You know, I didn't know what I'd find. I was like, you know, I just want to meet him, catch a vibe, maybe the haircut, maybe his walk. I'm going to find something from this dude that I could like steal. So I sit with this guy, and he's real laid back, and he's like, yeah, you know, you want to meet me? And so we're talking, I'm looking at him, I'm like, wow. I was rocking a goatee, I was like, wow, we got the same goatee. All right, our hair's lined up, and he said, well, what else do you want? I said, I'm just looking at you, man, to see what I could steal from you. He goes, man, I used to watch you. <laughs> so that's the TV stuff that's fun. The part that you don't see is that, um, you know, even within the context, and you work for, you know, NBC, MSNBC Cable. So you know, I don't know if you've met Tahira Bahadi McClure, who's the head of diversity and inclusion for Universal Cable. So what I find is that um, this passion for change and for influencing people, um, uh, I've experienced it around the world. There isn't a place that I've traveled on any continent that there haven't been people who have been positively influenced by the representation. And it was really important for me, especially in a show like New York Undercover, because if you do the math, I was playing, a tw I was 25 when I did that show with an 11 year old kid. Exactly. So if you do the math, I was a teenage dad that grew up and did right. And I based that character on my brother who became a father at 17. And I based it on my father and the influence that he had. So there were little things that I would do that was subtle while doing that show that I knew had positive impact. like. You know, the writers might have written, uh, JC prepares a TV dinner for Lil G. And I'd be like, no, props, go get some vegetables or some chicken or whatever. <laughs> and we're going to cook in the scene to send a subtle message. Or mm -hmm. G sits in front of the TV and does his homework. Absolutely not. My father wouldn't even allow us to have a television in the house. Right. So I'd say props, no, get a bunch of books, put them on the bed, let G sit amongst the books. There's so little things that I could do from my activist mentality, even within the context of yeah. doing television, how can we affect change? Oftentimes, a lot of folks don't know this, they think New York Undercover is the only thing I've done in television. I've actually done 11 series 
as a lead. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> they all get canceled. So the wisdom is if I'm in it, don't watch it. You get attached and then we're going to have separation anxiety. You're going to get killed. No. But the point is that I find myself oftentimes as the only person of color in productions. And so most recently I was doing a show called Alphas on sci-fi. We were a bunch of people with superhuman abilities. And so... I'm, I just couldn't understand that show, honestly. What's that? The I just couldn't understand it. That's why it got canceled. <laughs> you sent that memo. <laughs> so, but the point is, I found myself once again working within the Universal system. Yeah. I've actually done six series for Universal. So we've worked for the same Comcast folks. And so, this past year, I discovered uh, uh, that there were some initiatives around diversity and inclusion that were going on. And I've been doing a lot of that kind of work in communities and with corporations, but never really so much within the business itself. And so, as an actor in a show, I made it my business to learn who's in charge of what and begin to build relationships internally on the executive side. Because one of the things I say all the time is, is that um, there's such a disconnect. For instance, you know, I was down at Essence Music Festival and promoting Alphas, which no one knew was on the air. People still asking me about girlfriends and everything else that I used to do. <laughs> the TV show Girlfriends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that, and so I'm walking around the publicist and I'm like, so these women are following us from point A to point B, just curious to see what I'm up to clueless about the show and I'm telling the publicist I'm like can you please record this because they don't know no matter what kind of money you think they're spending to promote and to 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 touch our community they're missing the boat so long story short is I've made it my business at this point to work within the diversity with the diversity and inclusion folks and what I'm doing is I started a, a program with a friend of mine it's basically like American Idol for actors and it's an opportunity to provide a platform for people of color who can't be seen otherwise to be seen. And so we've got Universal sponsoring it. We've been doing it in New York. We're doing it in LA. There's an app for it. We're developing it into a TV show. And so the, 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 I guess at the end of the day, like you said, indigenous leadership. Mm -hmm. Indigenous leadership isn't just about the city you're in or the state you're in. It's the place you're in. That's right. So if you're at your job, mm -hmm. you're you know, in a city, I think that the, the important thing is to have a mindset of to be proactive, to have a mindset about, I'm in the, if I can say it, because I like to say it in this vernacular, but I'm in the give a fuck business. Or to give a damn That's business right. for those who might have been <laughs> offended. But you feel me? Because when I'm on a corner in Brooklyn where I live and I'm talking to young cats that I know don't vote, and we're just hanging out and they're looking at me because I still live in the city where they don't expect to see me and they come at me, it's an opportunity to say, yo, bro, I had a dude just a couple weeks ago get mad at me because I threw up a peace sign at him and didn't stop. Like, yo, Malik, what's up? What's up, Malik? I'm like, yo, peace. Yo, give me the peace sign. You better come over here and talk to me. <laughs> and like, this dude I know is up to no good on a regular basis. And so it's that moment that he comes to me wanting to fight because I threw up a peace sign at him. And it's in that moment that I walk up to him and say, yo, dog, you don't know me. No, you don't know me either. I was like, but that's not even how I'm coming at you, man. I'm coming at you from here. And so sometimes it's in those little moments. So we had our little interaction on the corner. And sometimes it's just about being proactive wherever you are. So even in the context of our, our crazy business, I think I, I still take uh, it very seriously, the opportunities to provide. And that young lady right there, I always figure up holding the camera, right there looking like, please don't look at me. Chile, <laughs> raise your hand. And this is just one example. <laughs> but this young lady, Twitter stalked me for a year. She did. Her passion, she graduated from school, she wanted to be a filmmaker, and for a year on Twitter and Facebook, she kept saying she wanted to be an intern. And over the course of the year, we've had an opportunity through social media to build a relationship. She's been on, on TV sets with me. She's gonna be working on some other stuff that I'm doing. She's here today filming. Um, we're working on a little documentary. But that's what we gotta do. Right, Shalay? <laughs> and she's
she lives in this area and she needs a job, <laughs> aside from what I do for her. So if anybody needs a young filmmaker, photographer, Shalay Madison, raise your hand. You got your card. Raise it up high, girl. Raise it up high. You got cards with you? Yes. All right, somebody here needs you, baby. Please holler at her. Um, well, all right. Time um, for some questions. I think underneath your chairs, there's a there are cards and pens, and if you want to write a question, um, they'll, they'll collect them and we'll ask questions. And but I want to, and while you're doing that, I want to bring this back, Dr. Christopher, to some to another issue that I think is so important, and that is health care. Because when we talk about health disparities, I mean, you know, just the subtle thing that Malik was talking about. In, you know, in a scene, seeing a father, a black father and son eating vegetables and, you know, real food that they cooked at home and not um, a TV dinner or McDonald's, right? I mean, just those things send subtle but really important messages. But also within our community, I think sometimes, you know, I, you listen to some of the messages and I think people don't realize that a lot of people in our communities don't have access to the opportunities to make those kind of good decisions, to have fresh vegetables, to buy, you know, instead of, um, or to see a doctor for, on a preventative level. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, thank you for that question. Ultimately, we don't have the luxury of a kind of an either or dynamic, right? Uh, there is oppression, there is racism, there is this idea of the haves and the have nots. And so we have to be resilient and we have to take control of our bodies and of our health. My background is as a holistic physician, a naturopath, a napropath, and clinical nutritionist. And for years, I had a practice on the south side of Chicago trying to, to get people to, to change the way they decided to live. Now, I don't want to get into this right wing sort of, you know, uh, it's all about choices, it's all about behaviors. It is, but it's more about resilience and it's more about loving ourselves. And that is the bottom line. Uh, most of the diseases that we experience in this country that are bankrupting these con this country are what we call lifestyle diseases, you know. But the real fulcrum in that is the stress that we're exposed to. And as people of color, we are exposed to more stress every minute, every second of every day. And so we have to put things in place, if we can, to mitigate the effects of that stress. And vegetables are the best way to do that, period. I want to say it again, vegetables, <laughs> fresh vegetables are the best way to do that. The worst thing we can do is sugar. Now there's this book I really wish everybody would read. It's called The Fat Switch. And this particular scientist has researched how the sugar triggers the obesity, the expression of the obesity genetic predisposition. It is the sugar that does it, right? Now, I think that's so ironic for us, The Fat Switch. It's so ironic for us because if you go back into the, the history and you look at the enslavement of our people, much of it was about sugar. So when we talk about activism and standing up, you know, that's a big thing we need to do. Uh, we do need to get access to quality medical care and it needs to be care that really does care about us. Uh, but the demographics of the medical profession make that less likely to be the case. So we've got, we've got a lot that we have to do, but, but I always tell people it begins with loving ourselves, loving our children, loving our elderly, being able to insist that if you walk into a grocery store and they don't have fresh vegetables, quality affordable vegetables, stand up about that too. You know, in addition to standing up about voting and education and the criminal justice system, we have to stand up about our own bodies and our right to live because we die disproportionately in, a, in an accelerated way as much from the burden of chronic disease I believe as we do from violence. So thank you for that question. Uh, it is part of our, our work 
is to stay alive and to stay resilient so that we can, as Dr. King would have said, we can truly overcome this absurd notion that we are inferior and have less value as human beings. And that's the notion that undergirds all of this craziness that we see today. No matter what it is, somehow they actually believe that we matter less as human beings. And that's the work, is to shift that belief. And there's a whole science of how you change how people believe. One of the projects that we funded, or several of it, has worked on this power of implicit bias, right? Mm -hmm. How a doctor can treat a person of color and a white person different, coming in with the very same symptoms, the very same diagnosis, and offer different treatment. And not even know that they're doing it. And that's the power of implicit bias, which is rampant in our society today. So Malik, I applaud your creativity. We have got to use the media to really play a major role in addressing this idea of the legacy of racism. And that is a work. That is a serious project. The media shapes our impressions. It, it shapes our understanding. How many times do you turn on television and the person that's going to die in that show is a person of color? I don't care what series it is, right? Or a movie. Or a movie. <laughs> you know, what is that message? Right. Awesome. It is reinforcing that that person's life right. <laughs> is of less value. I say turn it off. <laughs> don't go to those sponsors, you know? We have to stand up and assert the value of our own self and our own lives. And that is very important to, to being healthy. I would just ask, how many in this room have read Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons? Everybody in this room has to read that book. She is the first writer to tell the story of the great migration of our people from the South, mm -hmm. but to tell it from a place of strength and resilience, mm -hmm. to capture the courage that it took for people to leave and create a new life and change this country, change all these cities. And that's part of what's missing from our collective narrative. We don't tell those stories. Uh, yes, we had a civil rights movement, but more than a civil rights movement, we had indigenous people who had the courage to stand up and say no to oppression. And, and she tells those stories in ways that will just leave you mesmerized. So I really want to put a plug in for her book, and, and I'm hoping someday it becomes a series and a movie and everything else. So. <laughs> All right. I think we've got some questions. Yes, you would ask. So we'll do a couple questions. I do have one. Before we break. I'll come around to Um, the Warmth of Other Sons, S-U-N-S. Isabel Wilkerson, brilliant journalist. Okay, I'm gonna synthesize this. The, I'm, sh starts, I'm sure your audience doesn't know that the DC Convention Visitors Bureau is headed by an African American. He is only one of eight blacks running convention bureaus in the U.S. out of about 500 bureaus. How can we use our economic clout to continue to change that picture? Hmm. Reverend Barber? Well, one of the first things Joe? we can do <coughs> is, is come <laughs> and, find, and make sure that we know um, where these conventions are and who owns them. One of the things we have an opportunity to do in, in our state conference. Um, the NAACP, if you know, is made up of state conferences. And then those state conferences are made up of local branches. That was, that's what makes it unique. And all of them are volunteers. Mm -hmm. So actually, it, the model was to build from the bottom up. That was the model. One of the things we started doing in our state conference is, is before we go to a city, like this couple of weeks we'll be in Rocky Mount where we have tremendous African-American leadership. We first do a um, economic impact, what, in other words, what our convention will bring to that city. Mm -hmm. we, shouldn't ha we shouldn't keep having conventions all over the place and not sitting down and talking to the convention bureaus about the impact that bringing a thousand people in that city and taking up a thousand hotel rooms 
will create them. And if we're going to have an impact, then we ought to have some influence. We ought to have some influence who works during that weekend, who serves during that weekend, who staffs that convention during that weekend. You see? Because we're having an impact. And we, and we need to study that from our church denomination. I mean, we have some places we go to conventions and we're bringing 10, 15, 20,000 people. And, the, and every convention should be able to report when you leave, I think. And we've got to do a better job even this internally in the NAACP, even in our state conference. What was the economic impact and what did we get from it? Now, I, I think Karen, kind of bridging off of that question, because somebody, she raised the question of economics. When I talk about coalition building, I want folks to understand I'm not talking about um, uh, building coalitions around personalities. You need personalities. I'm a personality. You know, I have, I hope I am, I'm not, I'm a, you know, my, 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 my Amen. is a former yeah. white man. <laughs> you know, I'm Native American, I'm Tuscaroran, I'm white, and I'm black. <laughs> and we're involved in this movement. I understand you need leadership. I'm not foolish enough to say that. But, what must draw us together are the issues. And so, for instance, when we built our coalition in North Carolina, we started out with 14 issues, 14 point agenda. And we got environmentalists in the room, and we got people in the room who believed in public education, and people in the room who believed in dealing with disparities in the criminal justice system. And we asked this question, who's fighting you? And we kept naming the same people. So now, if the same people are fighting us, then why are we working together? Mm -hmm. You know, why, is, why are the environmentalists over here and the people standing for civil rights and voting rights over here and the people dealing with gender rights and sexual orientation are over here if the same people are fighting us? We ought to ask that question. So, as this, whoever asked that question about economics, one, we're saying in the NAACP now, and I wish we could get every national group. You know, one thing I wish sometimes with us is we could just come together and agree on something. <laughs> I mean, all, 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 you know, all of our national groups, why couldn't we agree that the agenda, we, we have five game changers in NAACP. We say the game changer that we ought to fight on for the 21st century is number one, economic sustainability, addressing poverty, jobs, and labor rights. Number two, um, educational equality, quality, education equality for all. Number three, health care for all, particularly protecting Medicaid, Medicare, and, and the Affordable Care Act, and even beyond that. Number five, addressing the disparities in the criminal justice system. And number six, pr protecting and expanding voting rights and, hum and civil rights and human rights. Now, what if we could all agree on that? I mean, what if we could have a day of jubilee as the Jewish people often hope for? You know, the, the year of jubilee, the 50th year, when everybody put down all the other stuff, mm -hmm. and every organization from the NAACP to the National Urban League, we all agreed on that one agenda. And then we agreed on it as an agenda, not just for black people, because you're not going to win, but an agenda for the soul of America. An agenda for transformation. An agenda for finishing the third reconstruction. I think then not only would we be able, which should, would we be able to have conventions, but we would be able to have unified conventions where all of us bring together our collective strength and work together. Now I'm from the country, and my, grandma, my, great, my grandfather said, if you want to cut a tree down, you can't just get an ax and just start hitting the tree everywhere. You hit in the same place over and over and over and over again. And if you do that long enough and consistently enough, mm -hmm. you will what we call fail the tree. But if you hit all over the place, the tree's gonna remain standing. And sometimes our enemies are still standing because we get caught up in organizational ego rather than a movement for the best of the people. I'm going to combine two questions and put it to Philip and Judith because they kind of go together. It's sort of talking about the criminal justice system. One question, one part of the question is why uh, is it that black leadership doesn't discuss the war on drugs, which obviously is a huge issue in the black community, and then sort of along with that, 
uh, Philip, someone was asking if you would talk a little bit more about Michelle Alexander's book for those who don't know, The New Jim Crow, mm -hmm. for those who may not know about it. But I, so I put these two together because, you know, it has to do with, you know, sentencing issues. It has to do with, even in high school when kids are being suspended, those issues, who is seen as the bad kid? I mean, and once that starts, and how you get in trouble and sort of what those stereotypes are and and then obviously you know we see that in terms of drug sentencing and we see that in terms of mm -hmm. just the cradle prison pipeline so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. well I think the first question that I would ask is who are black leaders who are these black leaders that we're talking about because everywhere I go the people I know, the young people I'm talking to, we're talking about the war on drugs. Absolutely. We're talking about getting arrested in school. We're talking about our schools feel like pre-detention camps. We're talking about getting stopped and frisked just by walking. Um, so um, to whomever did ask the question, I would say, as Reverend Barber has eloquently put it, and everybody here and everybody here knows it, it has to start locally. And uh, once we elevate that leadership locally, then black leaders or brown leaders or leaders that just represent our communities will talk about it. Um, I do think they're all linked because they are. You've got a school to prison pipeline that funnels young people out of schools and into jails. You've got in Florida a system that once you have a felony, you will never ever have a voice in the ballot box, so you will never be able to vote. And once you become a second class citizen, one who can't vote, one who can legally be discriminated against in housing and in employment and in any, every other area of human activity, what else do you have to turn to but the illegal um, ways to put food on your table? Um, and so they're all linked. That's why we talk about criminalization as a cycle um, that too many of us are being put into. And I think it's pretty easy to understand prisons are at the center of it. Um, and so I think we should talk about the war on drugs. We should talk about the school to prison pipeline. We should talk about anti-immigration because for some reason black people don't feel like um, the immigration fight is ours. Um, we, we have forgotten that, uh, that millions of Latino people, our brothers and sisters, are having their families divided and we've washed our hands on it and said that we won our fight 50 years ago, you get it for yourself. Um, when we've got millions of uh, people from the islands, many, of pe many people that look like us have a, a funkier accent, a better one. Um, uh, are being imprisoned and deported by the same companies that are arresting us on our corners. Um, and they've convinced us these, these aren't connected. So um, to directly answer the question, I think more people should talk about wars on drugs, but there are a lot of dots that we should connect. And once we do that, it, is, it will be easier, as Reverend Barber said, for us to have the same conversation because we're talking the same language. We're speaking the same things. And that leads to uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And she laid out um, in great detail um, the new slave system that's going on here in America. Companies like the GEO Group, CCA, Corrections Cooperation of America, are making billions and billions of dollars off of black bodies, um, off of brown bodies, off of poor white bodies, um, off of people with less opportunity, um, and no one's doing anything about it. Um, the new immigration bill, I'll probably lose some friends here, the new immigration bill is front loaded on um, enforcement at the border and they stand to make billions of dollars off the new immigration bill um, that they're forcing down people's throats now. And so we, we, we must talk about that and Michelle Alexander really started off, she didn't start the conversation but she laid it out so well in book form. Um, um, for so many people to understand, and um, I think it's a read for everybody, um, and you'll see how the how the dots connect. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think so, I'll talk just, I, I mean, I think this question about leaders is is an important one. I think that Phil is right. When you think about the school to prison pipeline, which advanced a project we've been working on it since we opened our doors in 1999. And what it is, is it, for those who don't know, the school to prison pipeline is the way in which young people are being criminalized starting in kindergarten in our schools. They are not only being suspended, but they are being expelled and they are being arrested in school. Mm -hmm. Five-year-old girls arrested for temper tantrums. Young boys and young girls being uh, kicked out of school and suspended because of the fact that they might have had an attitude one day. They rolled their eyes, they moved their neck. 
They were insubordinate. Mm -hmm. They have willful defiance. Right. All things that are nothing more than racial profiling in our schools. And so when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, actually that came from the ground. The leaders in that were young people who started the movement to say no more. And so I think the question of leadership is that young people, high school students, not even the 28 year olds, high school students are leading the way on this issue. And so I think we've got to, we got to redefine what leadership is and that we have to understand that it comes from our communities and it will bubble up. And we're having big wins on the school to prison pipeline. We have school districts that are moving away from it. We have school districts that are saying no more. But we need to understand that it came from the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. That zero tolerance was nothing more than taking what was from the criminal justice system and right. infusing it into schools. And not infusing it into schools in the white suburbs. That's right. But infusing it into schools where there were mostly majority kids of color. And so three strikes and you're out. We see it in the schools. The broken windows theory that's used in New York so that if you commit a small crime, you get some time. We're doing it in schools. And so we have used that because in some ways, our system believes that our children are criminals mm -hmm. and that we have to start them out as babies on that path to prison. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else on the panel want to weigh in? I saw some head shaking. I just want to applaud the leadership at this panel, and, and Judith just has done amazing work to, 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 to really, uh, I mean, their, their work is simply amazing, but I, I think it's so important for us as people of color to understand that this was, this model of criminalization was at the heart and soul of the experience of enslavement and everything post-enslavement. You know, one of the films we funded was Slavery by Another Name. Mm -hmm. And people believe that slavery ended in this country, you know, with emancipation. Mm. It didn't end until World War II. In fact, it still goes on today in yep. some places. But, but as, a, as a major enterprise that was fueling all the industries that built this country from the, the steel industries to the auto industries that black men and boys and, and some women would be uh, arrested for loitering, you know, right. and then sold into slavery mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and be worked to death, literally, mm -hmm. and, and then be buried in unmarked graves. Right. This went on until World War II when it was going to be an embarrassment to our country engaged in an international war, and that was the only time the justice system stopped it. So this DNA of our country in terms of criminalizing and negating the value of people of color, it, it, is, it is still very much there, and it will continue to morph and, and manifest until we do the work of standing up to our true humanity as one people. And this absurd notion that somehow we're different is, is a very important part of what we mm -hmm. have to do now. And we've never done it. Okay. And so this is our work. Yes, sir. You know, part of me, is, is, as I'm sitting here listening about this history, on the other side of that argument, too, isn't it amazing how response to criminalization has always been at the heart of the beginning of civil rights movements. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what I mean by that. For me as a person of faith, Christianity's movement begins with false criminalization. A good man is convicted, is wrongfully convicted as a felon. And so as a Christian, I follow a convicted felon who was killed wrongfully by the state. And that produced a whole new movement of people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that now produces, for instance, a Martin Luther King. The NAACP came into existence first and foremost because at the turn of the century, black men were being hung on an average of one per day. And could be hung for something as simple as looking in the eyes of a white person while walking down the street. And it was that criminalization that became the the blood, if you will, became the inspiration for a movement. So the first banners that hung out in front of the NAACP office was another black man died today in New York. Emmett Till gets killed August 28, 1955. 
Rosa Parks sits down December 1st, 55, in response to the blood. She says, I, I, I couldn't look at those distorted images in Jet Magazine and Time Magazine and stay anymore. So three months after Emmett Till is killed, Rosa Parks sits down, pushes Martin Luther King up. And then the March on Washington is held August 28, 1963, the same date as the death of Emmett Till. So the blood. And then 18 days after the March on Washington, <clears throat> four girls are killed. Dr. King delivers a eulogy and says that these girls are the heroines of our faith, of our movement. They have died nobly, but they speak to us. They have something to say. He lifts up that imagery out of Genesis chapter 4 where it says, and the blood cries from the ground. And it was their blood that turned some white southerners to the movement because up until then, they had been on the fence. But after you, they killed children in Sunday school, studying the Sunday school lesson, love your enemy. And the bomb blew up, the, the glass that the bomb blew out was the, the face of Jesus. A hole was blown, blown into the face of Jesus. But in some way, King talked about how the, as harmful and hurtful and mean as that blood was, it actually spoke to us in a way. That's why those kids went Freedom Summer 1964. That's where we get Selma from. And so, you know, I think it's, it's important for us to know Trayvon is death. We've got another death in Charlotte. But in some ways, so much of the, the, the inspiration for our movement comes from the place of death and criminalization. And so one way to hear, the, one way to receive this pain, the pain of a Trayvon, as I said to about a thousand students this morning at St. Augustine, if you're mad about Trayvon's death, then what do you hear the blood saying to you you ought to do with your life? That's right. That's right. You know, what, what does his blood say that you ought to be doing about being involved, like my brother, and voting rights or fighting against criminalization? Because the blood speaks, and it has always spoke to us as a people. I'm going to ask, I'm going to do one more question. <laughs> Because that was beautiful. But I want to leave on a, also on a positive note, and we have a college student who has a, a great question. Um, I'm a college student in a Democratic represented district. How do I organize along with peers in Boston and New York City to fight with Southern peers to secure voting rights? Um, once we're organized, what can we do to affect the legislation, state legislation in the South? You start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll concede I don't have all the answers. Um, Just get some. Can you, can you re -ask, ask the question for me, please? Thank you. <laughs> what can they do? Yeah. Organize. Yeah, get organized. Um, how well, do we, how, put it this way. How, you know, this, we're this is a young college student. Mm -hmm. This is a bit of homework, I would say, for all of us in this yeah. room. How do, and I'm going to pose the question to everyone on the panel. I'm going to mm -hmm. let you start. How do we move forward? What's the one thing? that each one of us can do, what's our homework that we can mm -hmm. do to move forward, whether that's to help in something, in the effort that you're doing, right. or a problem that you see needs a solution. I, 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 this it, was a northern student asking about mm -hmm. South. Yeah, no, no, I understand. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think first, yeah, I think first what, um, what must happen is, as we've been saying, it starts locally. And so if you want to build and we want to build something, it must be, if we're talking about building and we come into the table with power, you got to come to the table with power. And I think you do that by beginning locally. And you do that by beginning to engage in a conversation. And power is organized people and organized money. Okay? And unless that Boston student has a lot of money, uh, we're going to work with people. <laughs> and we begin, and you begin that with a conversation. And so I think it's built locally around issues that are central to your community. Um, it could be voting rights. It could be uh, uh, mass incarceration. It could be um, a number of issues, but you find them locally. And then I would offer to begin in a real way a conversation, whomever you, whoever you are, I like to start rapping because um, we need to find that agenda and start talking that same language that we've begun in a dialogue with students in North Carolina and in Ohio and New York and in New Jersey and even Vermont. 
um, and uh, begin that dialogue about what we all want with this power that we've organized. Um, it won't happen quickly, it never does. Um, and we start there, I think, I think the Reverend probably have some more direct um, um, answers around voting, um, but we've got to start the conversation. We've got to steer, meet people where they are, find their self-interest, direct them in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that builds leadership and develops a, a vision and an agenda. And then let's begin to start a conversation with students in Florida, because I don't have all the answers about what we can do and move on as an agenda for us moving into 2014, 16, 20, and, and 20 years beyond uh, after this damage has been done. So, um, yeah. so I wanted to, I just want to add quickly, I think, you know, be ready for a fix for the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby. Mm -hmm. um, folks need to, in your own congressional districts, um, really be aware of what's happening in this discussion about fixing the Voting Rights Act, um, because we'll be seeing that fight over the next two years, two to three years. If we don't get something quickly, well, then we'll be fighting. We'll be using that as a turnout issue in 2014. If if this Congress don't work for us, we're gonna get a new one um, in a nonpartisan kind of way. Um, and um, and also just watch what's happening in your states because now, because especially if you're in the South, you know, without Section Five. Um, we nothing. need to be monitoring what election officials are doing because they could just move a polling place. Mm -hmm. He can tell you, in North Carolina, they move very quickly to shut down some polling places and that can change the outcome of an election like this. And so we need to be monitoring that and if you find that there's a problem, you call the Department of Justice, you email Advancement Project, www.advancementproject.org, Right to vote at advancementproject.org and let us know what is happening because we are ready to sue where we have to. Mm -hmm. um, and you, but you all have to organize where you can because you can make a difference and change things without us even having to sue. I'm going to go to Reverend. If you don't mind, I'm going to go to Malik next because I know one piece of homework was to get that young woman a job. I don't see her still standing. <laughs> there she is. No, no, no. I know that's one thing you're working on. But your thoughts? One, one takeaway. You know, I mean, I think it always just comes down to, you know, think and act locally or globally and act locally. I think that obviously it's a huge issue. I think that, you know, it's great to see someone like, you know, um, our young brother here is 28. Reminds me of when I was 28. I just turned 46 two days ago. It was my birthday. Come on. Thank you. Is it cake too? No. Um, but I think that um, it becomes overwhelming, and I think that, you know, you spoke to this when you gave the apology uh, to uh, Congressman Lewis about the, the, you know, the fact that we've dropped the ball. And I think that we do live in a world now where there's such a saturation of media, there's such a culture of, of celebrity, and so folks are distracted. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. um, young people are more interested in Instagramming what they're doing, even when they're out, right? Yeah. They're even enjoying what they're doing. They're like, let me take this picture and put it on Instagram. And so. I think that even within that context, we have to figure out in small ways, just continue to be proactive and not try to, you know, chop down the tree by smacking it all over the place, but thinking of one little thing that we can do. Um, and, and, and at least that's what I do on, on a daily basis, just try to figure out how I can affect, you know, some change. Coming here today, um, I happened to run into a, a man, um, who started the school that my son goes to. And I had never met him before, and we're on the train, the Amtrak, and then I gave him a ride to his hotel, and before he got out the car, I said, how can I help? And sometimes it's just that simple. How can I help? And I love to say to people, how can I help you help me help you? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, uh, words to live by. How can I help you help me help you? Mm -hmm. Reverend Barbara. If you ask the right question, you get the right, sometimes the, the, the point is to pose the right question. That's the right question. What can I do? Because mm -hmm. inside of that question, who asked it, who raised it? Inside of that question is, a, is seemingly an understanding that, in, for instance, in, if I'm in Boston, but if in North Carolina, a group of elected officials decide to deny 17-year-olds the right to pre-register, decide to roll back same-day registration, 
cut back early voting, cut back Sunday voting, decide to pass a law that says if you're a college student, private or public, your ID is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, decides to deny 367,000 people access to the poll who have already been voting. The question, whoever asked that question must understand, seems to understand that those lawmakers are doing that as a test case. Not about North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's about a test. Can we get away with this? Yes. And then if we get away with it, can we spread it? So the question is right. What must I do, not just to help the South, mm -hmm. but what must I do because what's happening in the South has national and historical implications. Mm -hmm. So once you ask that question, now we're brothers and sisters in a common mind. Mm -hmm. So then what we're able to do is come to the South like they did. So we're going to have Freedom Summer in North Carolina next year, and I hope some other people, I want to invite you to come, and I'm going to give you a number. You text NAACP to 46988. Just text NAACP later on to 46988. Come on down to the South and join the indigenous leaders. Mm -hmm. Spend some time. Get a, be a part of teams. We had a team yesterday, a group of folk who got arrested. They went in Rocky Mount all day mm -hmm. registering voting. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave some people that got arrested community service. We said all our community service is going to be registering people to vote. <laughs> so we're going to have nine, we're going to have a thousand people, you, so, <laughs> you know, doing voter registration. So you come south, mm -hmm. let's build that movement. Now, the other piece of it is, I'm come, I've been invited to Boston. So whoever that was, I want to come up to Boston and talk about why what's going on in North Carolina is important to you living in Boston. Mm -hmm. we, get, we must not allow them to separate us state by state, but understand that the, the South is the crucible of change, but it's also about all the crucible of regression. They test it first. They test it first in the South and in these state capitals. And that's what we must understand. The last thing I think for that young, if that was a young person that asked that, um, Karen, we have got, we, we need young people like my brother and others, mm -hmm. and I keep thinking about this after we get to the half century mark, that, that have not lost their idealistic view mm -hmm. and refuse to believe Goliath's lie. Hello. I mean, we got to have you who just refuse to believe that folk are so strong they can't be knocked down. Mm -hmm. That people have so much power that they can't be turned around. Mm -hmm. who, who, who refuse to just say, well, there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> we need young folk who don't believe Goliath's lie, who believe that if they try and do something, there's a higher power that will give uh, force to the rock they throw. <laughs> and cause even Goliath. We need young folk. If you think about biblical history, it was young people. Mm -hmm. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and that band mm -hmm. Negro. <laughs> Who were not 40 years old, but were somewhere between 18 and 22. Who defied King Nebuchadnezzar. Who found out that if you dare to go in the fire, you might come out and not even have the smell of smoke on you and transform the whole nation. Dr. King wasn't an old man. Let's don't, demit Let's don't make him an old man. Let's don't make John Lewis an old man. Let's don't tell that history as though these were old people. In fact, some of the elders, Dr. King's own leader of his denomination, told him to shut down. But he was young enough to break through that and to still believe. And then, then finally, Karen, to all of us in here, you know, if Harriet Tubman got 500 folk out of slavery, see, I have to operate from a place of hope because we're saved by hope. If Harriet Tubman got 500 folk out of slavery and she didn't have Twitter, <laughs> and she didn't have email, and she didn't have Facebook, 
and she didn't have Gmail, and she didn't have MySpace, and she didn't have a, a smartphone for dumb folk. If she didn't have none of that, all she had was North Moss on the north side of a tree, a North Star, and a 38 in her pocket in case she wanted to go back to slavery. <laughs> Folk out of slavery. We got Karen, we got this brother, we got Malik, we got Judah, we got Kellogg Foundation with a hundred million dollars. We got all There ought not be anything and no force of oppression that we can't be. The only way we lose is to enter into the critical thing that oppression operates within, and that is delusion. The, the, the oppressor is deluded because they believe wrong is right. What we can't do is enter into that space of delusion. That's why our language must be right. Not Democrat and Republican. Yeah. Not liberal versus conservative, mm -hmm. but we must have a new discourse mm -hmm. about what's right and what's wrong, and remember that right has never lost. It's had the hell beat out of it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, right has never lost. Even when crucified, it gets up again. <laughs> Okay, go after that. I was going to say, that's the first What do you say after that? What do you say after Amen. that? Oh, Amen. Amen. You know? Amen. All right. Amen. I feel like a strong woman can follow that. All right. I, I was just going to say that the most important lesson that I have learned and I've tried to teach my children that will carry us no matter what is the message of love. Amen. Is the message of knowing that we are never alone, that we are always loved, mm -hmm. that we are connected to all that is right and all that is divine and all that is powerful. And if we know that in our hearts and we teach that to our children, then we surely will prevail. And the fight, the ultimate fight, what we must overcome is fear. That's right. There are only two, there's really only one power in the universe, and it's the power of love. Mm -hmm. But the opposite of that is fear. Mm -hmm. And it is fear that undergirds all of these illusions and all of this violence. That's right. And so I would just say to us to walk in the knowing, the knowledge of who we are. None of us would be in this room today if it wasn't for the work for the last hundred plus years of the NAACP. Okay. And the lives that were lost, you can't even count them. But our work is not finished. And so I say when you leave this place today, please leave with, with a renewed sense of purpose and read the life of Frederick Douglass and read the life of Harriet Tubman and read Isabel Wilkerson and all this other wonderful Jim Crow. Just feed our minds and our hearts with the truth of who we are, what we have overcome, and what we will overcome, and it is that that is truly the salvation of this nation. Thank you. All right. Amen. With that, I want to thank our panel.